Jesus once said, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. And I think we all know that Jesus here is talking about the cross. He is talking about his one day future sacrifice. Now, I shouldn't have to tell you what a sacrifice is. We should all know. A sacrifice is when we give up something to help someone else. Tomorrow is Memorial Day, and that is a day set aside to recognize those who gave up their lives, right? To recognize those who sacrificed. Not to be confused with Veterans Day. Veterans Day is for everyone who has ever served, and that is a day where we recognize veterans, we recognize those who are in the military. But Memorial Day is specifically reserved for those who never got a chance to remove their uniform. It is a day of remembrance for the fallen. And I know for most, Memorial Day is uh, a day for hot dogs and hamburgers, but we cannot take it for granted, especially as Americans. The rest of the world does not enjoy the same freedoms that we do, and the only reason that we have those freedoms is because there are those who sacrificed. So we take this day and we honor the men and the women who gave it all. And really, when we think about it and we go over what this day means in our heads, we are moved, right? We are, we are moved. If we watch a video of servicemen or women or we see a uh, a casket that's draped with the American flag, I think it moves us. I mean it better, right? I mean, I think we're hardwired that way. We all are. We, we can't talk about sacrifice without getting a little emotional. And it's not, just, it's not just military sacrifice. It's any sort of giving or sacrifice. And I think while we can all appreciate Memorial Day, if we're not enlisted or if we don't come from a military family, it's difficult to grasp the price that's paid. We cannot understand what it means to be in the trenches with gunfire whizzing over our heads. Our minds can't grasp the scenes that live in the minds of our soldiers from day to day. And most of us will never know the sorrow of watching our comrades die. So this day is set aside to remember. And speaking of remembering, it's been 78 years since World War II. That's a long time ago. Today, you and I enjoy a freedom that had a cost. World War II took 62.5 million lives. That was 3% of our global population. And it wasn't all soldiers. No, most of those people were civilians. Lest we forget, is the slogan that accompanies Memorial Day. We must never forget. To forget is to commit an act against the many lives caught in the crossfire of every bloody battle and the troops who fought to protect our freedom. But this morning, I would like to take it even further and suggest that as a Christian, it's impossible for us to celebrate our spiritual freedoms without remembering the real MVP who made our liberation from sin possible. Jesus waged a war of unsurpassed sacrifice. Even when we put all the suffering and deaths of every single earthly war together, his anguish and his sacrifice deserves its own recognition, lest we forget. And we do. We do forget. I think the world forgets. I believe it's just as un-American to consider forgetting the sacrifice and death of every soldier and civilian life lost during a war and the ongoing wars. It is equally a travesty to dishonor Jesus' service and his sacrifice, lest we forget ourselves what he has done. And, you know, there are many today who still don't even believe Jesus was a real person. <laughs> it's true. But let me reassure you, 
The writings of the first century Jewish historian Josephus include references to Jesus and the origins of Christianity. The Roman historian and Senator Tacitus referred to Christ, his execution by Pontius Pilate, and the existence of early Christians in Rome. Sometime between 73 CE and the third century, a Stoic philosopher named Mara wrote a letter to his son, which contains an early reference to the crucifixion of Jesus. The Babylonian Talmud contains references to Jesus. Pliny the Younger, the provincial governor of Pontius and Bithia, wrote to Emperor Trajan concerning how to deal with Christians who refused to worship the emperor and instead worshiped the one called Christ. Jesus existed. And there's no doubt about that. And to fully appreciate his sacrifice, we need to fully appreciate who he is, who he fully is. Jesus asked that question once of his own followers. In Matthew 16, it says, Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Just look at that answer right? Look at that answer. It's all over the place. And I would offer the answer that's given today by the world probably has not changed very much. For many, he is a respected religious teacher. And I say many because I think it includes many people who claim to be Christian as well. Recent studies say that 63% of America professes to be Christian. That's a lot, right? That's a really good number. But when you really probe in on what that number means. You just dig a little deeper what those people actually believe. You get a much different number. 63% might say they're Christian, but the last Barna study showed that only 6% of America has a biblical worldview. Only 6%. What does that mean? It means only 6% of America believes that absolute truth exists and that the truth is found in the Bible, or that all people are born with a sinful nature, or that Jesus had a virgin birth, or that heaven and hell are real places. Very little believe that Jesus was actually God in human form, a perfect man and a perfect God, and that only by believing in him and him alone are we saved. The question of who Jesus is continues to be this fast-changing reality and not for the better. For instance, pleasing people rather than God is a value today. Society is tolerant of the things that God explicitly said not to be tolerant of. Truth and scripture is subjective. It's always changing by the culture, by the climate. Pluralism is more widely accepted, meaning all religions lead to the same place. Today's society rejects authority and would rather favor just going along with what everybody else says. Why is that? Well, Christians are allowing worldly influences to affect their understanding of Jesus, and even more Christians turn a blind eye to it. But Jesus was not a mythological figure. He lived on this earth, and yes, for the most part, as a respected teacher, but he was more than that. In fact, he said that he was your close friend. You know, when soldiers go off to war, they know that there is a risk of not coming back. So what drives a soldier to take those risks? Why serve? Why sacrifice? I bet if I stood in the enlistment line, I'd hear plenty of reasons, but I bet you none of them would say, I'm serving for my congressman. I'm serving for our economy. I'm serving for the film industry. No, you'd hear stories about families, friends, children, grandchildren. Our soldiers sacrifice for the freedoms and the people who rely on those freedoms, and they are willing to do their part to make a difference. In John 15, 5, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever remains in me and I in him will bear much fruit, because without me, you can do nothing. This is not something Jesus said to a crowd. He didn't say this in a church service. No, his audience here are the 12 disciples, people who've spent days with him, ministry with him, 
being ridiculed because of him, denying creature comforts because of him. And it is this relationship that he's speaking about here in verse 5. He's referring to their relationship, their friendship as being intimate, as being organic. He suggests his relationship is the result of one thing. He says in verse 15, No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. Jesus is the sacrifice who lays down his life for his friends. Yes, too many, Jesus is a teacher. But Jesus says, no, it's more than that. So Jesus enlists, Jesus suits up, he puts on flesh, and he is sent as an army of one because Jesus was sent to rescue us. Our friend came to rescue us. I read that earlier passage in Matthew 16 where Jesus asked his disciples who he was. But after he asks that, he changes his question to a more intimate question, and he redirects it back at them. Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. That's the only right answer. In fact, that's the reason that Jesus can save us. That's the reason that he can sacrifice for us, because he is who he is. And you know, while the rest of the world can stand at a distance, speak user-friendly language, tolerate what is socially acceptable, and repeat just what everybody else is doing, we need to stand alone on the hill and announce, without apology, for who he is and who he says he is. Our answer needs to be the same as Peter's. The Apostle Paul said in Romans 1, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God as to salvation for everyone who believes. We need more people to stand up and shout these words. I am not ashamed. This is, this is not a new thing, church. Throughout history, the church, people like you, have paid the price to worship and serve Jesus with their life. All the disciples except one were martyred for their testimony about Jesus. The freedom we have today to be here right now to worship the Lord cost early Christians dearly the Bible that sits in your lap or that sits in the pew stands. Just to have it costs thousands of people their lives. The Bible was not free because it cost many people their lives and yet we take it for granted. One man who gave his life so that we could all own a personal Bible was this man, William Tyndale. William Tyndale was a 16th century scholar, translator. He became a leading figure in the Protestant Reformation towards the end of his life. He was influenced by the work of Erasmus, and uh, he made the Greek New Testament available in Europe. And of course, Martin Luther, who led the Protestant movement. Tyndale was the first to translate several uh, large chunks of the Bible into English for the public. Others had tried before, they got a little bit of progress here and there, but Tyndale's Bible was the first English translation to draw directly from the Hebrew and Greek texts, and it was the first to take advantage of the new printing press, which of course allowed his Bible to have worldwide distribution. Of course, this didn't sit very well with the organized religion of his time, and he quickly made an enemy of people who were in power, but Tyndale did not back down. In fact, he shouted all the more, I am not ashamed. And he openly published articles where he condemned King Henry VIII's divorce. And he said that if any pope blessed that divorce, they were corrupt. That didn't go over too well. In 1535, Tyndale was arrested by church authorities. He was jailed in the castle of Brussels for over a year. He was tried for heresy. He was strangled. He was burnt at the stake in 1536. But that didn't stop the Tyndale Bible. It continued to play a key role in spreading the Reformation across Europe. In fact, later on, the 54 scholars who created the King James Bible in 1611, they took 83% of Tyndale's New Testament, and they took 76% of his Old Testament. Tyndale felt the truth was worth dying for. 
He felt that people being able to read the truth in their own language was worth dying for. And tomorrow we can celebrate our freedoms because our soldiers felt that those freedoms were worth dying for. But here today, on the Sunday, before Memorial Day, we also need to understand that Jesus willingly gave up his life so that you and I could enjoy freedom from sin, that we could enjoy freedom in the Holy Spirit, freedom in the kingdom of God. We could not worship the Lord today like we do if it were not for the sacrifice of Jesus. His sacrifice cost dearly because it cost him his life, but he gave it willingly so that you and I could experience new life, so that you and I would have the gift of inheritance, the ability to have an intimate relationship with God. All of those freedoms, those come as a result of Christ's sacrifice. Alongside, lest we forget, there is something else that you may hear tomorrow, and that is freedom is not free. Freedom will always cost a price. Even King David understood the concept long before Jesus, long before the cross. First Chronicles 21, David said to Ornan, give me the site of the threshing floor that I may build on it, an altar to the Lord. Give it to me at its full price, that my plague may be averted from the people. Then Ornan said to David, take it and let my Lord the king do what seems good to him. See, I give the oxen for burnt offering and the threshing sledges for the wood and the wheat for a grain offering. I give it all. But King David said to Ornan, no, but I will buy them all for the full price. I will not take for the Lord what is yours, nor offer burnt offerings that cost me nothing. So David paid Ornan 600 shekels of gold by weight for the site. And David built there an altar to the Lord and presented burnt offerings and peace offerings and called to the Lord. And the Lord answered him with fire from heaven upon the altar of burnt offering. David knew, right? David knew that an offering or a sacrifice, it needed to cost him something. And if it didn't, then it didn't mean anything. He offered up the sacrifice to the Lord because he was trying to spare many people. And so he knew this has to come at a cost. And his sacrifice later spared many people, saved Israel from destruction, all because David was willing to pay a price so that deliverance and freedom could return to Israel. David knew that Freedom required a cost. Deliverance requires cost. Jesus knew that too. Jesus sacrificed because he felt that you were worth dying for. Let me start to close this by asking a very serious question. I want you to think about this. Who would you die for? Who would you die for? And think about it. Who comes immediately to mind? Your children, your spouse, your parents, a really good friend. I mean, they'd have to be a really, really good friend, right? In order for you to die for them. And maybe if I asked you who you would die for, certain names, certain faces come to mind immediately because in our minds, those people, they have some value to us. Their lives have some value to us. We see something in them that's worth dying for. But what about somebody that you see no value in? Would you die for someone that you consider to be worthless? How about your boss? Would you die for them? Would you die for your accountant? Would you die for the person at your bank? Would you die for the person who backstabs you? Talks about you behind your back? What about the person at work, the coworker that got you fired? What about that friend that took your spouse or harmed your children? Would you die for them? Would you die for a Muslim? Would you die for a communist? Would you die for a Republican? Would you die for a Democrat? Now let me ask you this, who would die for you? Who would die for you? Think about that for a minute. Who would die for you? You know, when Jesus hung on the cross, 
He looked down on five people, his mother, his aunt, the wife of Clopas, Mary Magdalene, and John. And what did he see in those people? He saw people worth dying for. John, though, was full of pride. He always asked to be seated on the right or the left side of Jesus when Jesus came into power. The first three times he ever spoke to Jesus, he was rebuked. But Jesus knew there was something in John that was worth dying for. There's Mary Magdalene. She used to be demon-possessed. Jesus saw something in her worth dying for. Peter was brash, impetuous, fearful. Jesus saw something in him worth dying for. Judas was a traitor, a thief. Jesus saw something in him worth dying for. Simon was a zealot. He was part of a radical group that used guerrilla tactics to kill Romans. Jesus saw something in him worth dying for. Hanging on a cross between heaven and earth, what did Jesus see? He saw two other men, right? Criminals, one on his left, one on his right, being crucified with him. He also saw his Roman executioners gambling over his clothing, indifferent to his suffering. He also saw the religious leaders who were the ones who specifically came to watch him die. They were the ones who petitioned for his death. And yet Jesus saw something in the Roman soldiers who beat him and mocked him that was worth dying for. Jesus saw something in the soldiers who nailed him to the cross, worth dying for. He saw something in Caiaphas and Ananias, worth dying for. He saw something in Pilate and Herod, worth dying for. He saw a reason to die for every mocker in the crowd. Because he knew every hair on their heads, he formed their innermost parts. And then when they were in the womb, he saw the one who made them in secret, who wove them together in the depths of the earth, who knew the number of their days right down to the second and who caused the sun to shine on them and the rain to water their field and crops. He was the one who searched them. He knew the very contents of their heart and he still found them worth dying for. Because as we all know, So very famously, God so loved the world, the whole world. Everyone who has, is, or ever will live on this magnificent little blue ball, right? He made and he loves every one of us so much that he took on flesh and he dwelt among us and he tried to lead us back to the right path. And then he let them Nail him to sin. Why? Why would he do that? So that whoever believes in him, that's the key right there. That's the biblical truth the world needs to hear. So that whoever believes in him can become part of his kingdom. And Jesus died for you. Because he saw something, he saw someone in you worth dying for. And he did all of that. So this Memorial Day, what do you remember about what Jesus did for you? And what are you willing to do for him? You know, five of Jesus' closest friends stood at the foot of the cross The rest were too afraid. You know, out of all the hundreds of people who followed him, the thousands he fed and healed, five stood shoulder to shoulder with his enemies and said, I am not ashamed. What about you? How close are you willing to get to the cross? Are you willing to stand so close that the blood spills on you? Are you willing to face the ridicule and the scorn of the crowd, of the world? Are you willing to risk your life? Where do you stand? Close to Christ? Or do you feel like, oh, I, I, can, I, I, can, I can watch from a distance? How do we, now more than 2,000 years later from this event, how do we get close enough to the cross to be covered by his blood? How do we get close enough to hear him breathe or speak 
Becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ, that should be the only desire of your heart. But in order for that to happen, you have to follow. We must teach the things that Jesus taught. We must model the things that Jesus did. And yes, we should even experience the sacrifice of the cross. And when you know this, when you believe this with your whole heart and soul, you won't be able to stand at a distance. You will want to stand for him, to be there, to be with him, no matter what the cost. Anyone can hide in the crowd, right? In fact, the further you are away from the cross, the safer you will be. You could stand hundreds of miles away from the cross and call yourself a disciple, but it won't cost you anything. In fact, from 100 miles away, can you even see the cross? And if you can't see it, then you don't have to worry about it. But a real disciple of Jesus is the one who gets to the foot of the cross and stands dangerously close, and yes, even stands in the presence of others who hate him. You know, a person's last words are important, right? A person's last words, they're remembered, they're written down. From the cross, Jesus gives us a picture of what it means to be his disciple, to be the church, Christians caring for one another, as those relationships between a child and a parent. One of the last things Jesus ever said was, here is your son, here is your mother. Those words remind us. Mary's mission, John's mission, that's our mission too. We are called to care for those that Jesus cared for, as if they were our own family. Because, well, spiritually speaking, they are. What are we called to fight for? Where do we serve? How do we sacrifice? All for the kingdom of God. God's kingdom is a place where we are called to be brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers to one another. It's a place, though, which we are to be brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers to the community, to the world. And yes, even to those who hated Jesus, even those who hate us, because his kingdom and his freedoms, they are worth the sacrifice. Pray with me. Lord, on this Memorial Day, our hearts and minds are with those who are serving, even now. They fight for our freedoms. We thank you for their families, their children, their parents who are at home. And we ask you to be with their prayers. We pray that you though, also comfort those who've lost who have given the ultimate sacrifice of their very life. It is rare that a parent would know what it means to bury their child. And yet, you know that pain. That is something that they have in common with you. There is comfort in Christ. There is comfort in his cross because there is freedom. Lord, we experience so many freedoms today, especially here in America. And we take all of these freedoms for granted. But especially as Christians, we take our relationship with you for granted. We take the freedoms we have from sin for granted. We take our blessings for granted. We take your word for granted. May we remember this Memorial Day. Sacrifices that were given for us, that we might live with these freedoms. We thank you. We thank you for blessing. Amen.
Hey, thanks for worshiping with us this morning. Of course, I want to remind you that we have two services, one at 930, which is our traditional service, and one at 11, which is our contemporary. At 11 o'clock, we also have a full children's program from birth all the way through high school, and we would love to be the church where you live. Thanks, guys. I'll see you next week. Bye.